today two very old friends of mine, um, James and Luke from Horsemeat Disco. Let's give them a Thank you. And when I asked them what album do you want to present, because I was thinking it's not, I love disco. Those of you that know me, I know I have a very long history with disco myself. Um, but I haven't really had many disco albums I could feature in full on Classic Album Sundays. So I posed this question to Luke and James, and they came up with just the perfect, perfect answer. And I was so excited, because I was, uh, I pulled out my original copy, I listened to it, I was like, I remember actually all the lyrics as well. So I'm going to kind of leave it to you two. I wanted to kind of, maybe you could tell the story behind this album for people. Okay. And then we'll, I'll we'll ask try. you why, why it really is such a personal favorite of your own. Cool. Well, I think if anyone knows us, because we have a radio show on Rinse FM on Sundays, and you would, if you listen to it, you'd know that we love Diana Ross, and we also love Ashford and Simpson, who produced this album for her in 1979. And at that time, she was the biggest female artist in the world, really, and the first real African-American kind of global superstar as well. She could sell out arenas and stadiums, and this was before Whitney Houston and Janet Jackson and Tina Turner had her come back in the 80s, so she was like the only one up there. And she obviously had been with the Supreme, so she was massive during that time. She sold billions of records, had loads of number ones. She went solo in 1969, and this album was released 10 years later. And her career had not really hit the skids, but she needed a hit. She hadn't had any hits for a while. And Ashford and Simpson, who produced this, had produced her first album and her third album. And they'd provided her with two really important songs for her career the revamped version of Ain't No ha Mountain High Enough and Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand, which were two really big records that she used in her live shows. So Barry Gordy of Motown, who was kind of her father figure, her lover, the father of one of her children, you know, the Svengali that kind of controlled her career, he brought Ashford and Simpson back for this album so that she could hopefully get a hit because it was in the middle of the disco era. And the last big hit she'd had was Love Hangover at the beginning of disco in 1976, and that was a, like number one. So yeah, in between that, she hadn't done that well, but this album kind of was a relaunch. And amazingly, it didn't do that well because she was, the competition in 1979 was Donna Summer. So she was the, uh, the big competition for Diana Ross and she was the queen of disco. And uh, Donna Summer had five top five singles in the US charts, three of which were number ones in 1979. Diana didn't have any. I don't think she, I think she had one top 20 uh, song, which was The Boss. And I was thinking about the album and about her career and how huge she was. And kind of now, it's kind of post the Diana Ross era. And maybe people forget about her, that she really did blaze a trail for people like Beyonce, for Whitney, for Janet Jackson, even for Madonna and Lady Gaga. She incorporated dance in her live shows as well. So, But I was thinking, I was imagining, and I was thinking maybe they called this album The Boss because of Donna Summer had suddenly stolen her thunder and she was like, you might be the queen of disco, but I am the boss, you know? <laughs> so, I don't know, that's just my imagination, but anyway. So, yeah, we, we love this album. It's got about five disco tracks and then three ballads. And... Uh, kind of nice reggae. Yeah, and like this one, yeah. Kind of thing yeah, is, is awesome. It's My House, which is, it was a club record as well, wasn't it? I mean, they're all kind of club records. I mean, some of them are more peak time, up tempo, and there's definitely some Under <coughs> the Night ones in there as well. So, uh, and a couple of really nice ballads. And always get into the ballads as well. The don't, Boss. Don't skip through the ballads. Yeah, The Boss as well, the track is like still a massive record at Horse Meat Disco. We play it virtually every week. In fact, if we don't play it, people, yeah, people kind of moan. It. <laughs> and it's just one of those joyous, songs that is got a great the thing about Asher and Simpson is they're really good songwriters so the lyrics in all these songs are really good um Asher and Simpson it has to be said for those of you that don't know they were writing songs from the 60s a husband and wife team uh writing producing artists in their own right musicians just a real tour de force I mean they wrote probably the most classic disco song before it was even made into a disco song it was just a soul tune when uh Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye did it. Of course, we're talking about Ain't No Mountain High Enough. 
that was Valerie Simpson and Nick Ashford. I mean, there's, like, there's so many. They also wrote, you know, you might I'm know. Every Woman, they wrote that. So, I mean, that just, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So the fact, very, Gordy was very smart to put Diana with this amazing, amazing team. And it really did reinvigorate her career. I mean, we should probably quickly talk about what happened next after this album. Well, this album, okay, so it wasn't a commercial success. All the club tracks off it were big club records and Larry Levan used to play a lot of the tracks off this album, especially once in the morning at the Paradise Garage. <coughs> but the next album, Barry Gordy got Chic to produce that one and that was the one with Upside Down and I'm Coming Out and My Old Piano and that was the record that gave her the hit that she needed, it gave her the number ones, it gave her the number one single, I think both sides of the Atlantic. But the thing we like about this one is that it hasn't gone like the way that a lot of music in 1979 had gone sort of more Euro, it's sort of sticking to the kind of more soul black music tradition yeah. of America. So the up-tempo like, R&B. Yeah. Maybe if this record had come out a couple of years early, it would have been bigger, because it had sort of sound that was more like the Gloria Gaynor style of disco, the soulful, up-tempo. The stuff. thing about Ashton Simpson as well is that, you know, Diana Ross was always kind of criticised in a way for not having a very good voice or having a kind of average voice. But Ashton and Simpson really know that we're really able to like bring out the best of her voice. Bring and, out the power in the voice. And you're here on this album. And also Valerie Simpson and her have quite similar voices, so I think she was the perfect person to write songs for Diana Ross because she would do a demo and sound quite like Diana, and then Diana would be able to, it was easy for her to interpret the songs. Because actually Diana Ross does have like a pop jazz voice really, rather than a big soul. gospel yeah. soul voice. Right, it is much more delicate. Anyway, the other two in the Supremes had to definitely have more of the power on the bottom. Yeah. And um, yeah, she has much more of that kind of floaty pop voice, but she has the, a li that bit of that gospel inflection yeah. coming into this. Yeah, I yeah. Think, you know, they definitely wonders. bring the power out of her voice in some of the tracks. You can go right in. Just, yeah. just you go right in there. Yeah, but, uh, go ahead, take a seat. <laughs> thanks thanks for coming, everybody. Disco. Yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> this is great. It's good to see so many come people in. here. Yeah, come on in. We'll have to see. It would be all right. It's great. Perfect. Now, I wanted to ask you quickly uh, before we listen to the album when did you guys? first get into this album? Just your own personal recollection. Probably about, mm, when I started getting into Ashford and Simpson was probably about 1990, because I'd been buying a lot of house records and then I was discovering about disco and, I mean, I knew about disco and I knew about Chic and I knew some, you know, I knew some of the hits from it, but I suppose, yeah, I started getting more into the underground New York disco and then, yeah, I got a bit obsessed with Ashford and Simpson, so then I just, was buying everything that they produced because they, they produced two al really good albums for Gladys Knight and the Pips as well and so anything that had their name on it whether it was a song they'd written or the, whether they produced I would buy it and I suppose that was when I got a copy and yeah and then I think I got it on CD as well so I think yeah. when I came into the album a bit, a bit later I think I, I knew the boss and I knew them sort of as individual sort of songs but um, I remember seeing Honey, Honey came down when we, Honey Dijon Came down and saw us when we played it. Plastic people once, mm. and she just bum rushed the deck. She just, gra <laughs> she just grabbed grabbed an album like stuck and put it on. once in the morning on. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, New York what style. What is this record? It's yeah, amazing, and she yeah. really worked it. And then yeah. by the end of it, it was like, I need to go and get that album. And then that's how I kind of got the album. And then listen to it because, like you said, it's not all the time. Like you buy a disco because there's a couple of tracks on the album, mm -hmm. and just the rest of it's pretty dirge. But it's kind of really nice when you find a whole album that from start to finish is just like beautifully produced, great songs and. Absolutely. Also, one of the tracks on the album, It's My House, which was a little, which was a hit in the UK as well. I was listening to that the other day and I was thinking, maybe house is a metaphor for her body because it's kind of a funny song. And then I was like listening to it and I was thinking, maybe it's actually a really sexy song. It's my house and it's I live here. Of Donna. Yeah, so maybe. she was trying to, and also once in the morning, once in the evening, that's not talking about brushing your teeth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I played that on Vessel <laughs> Radio the other day, and that was the one that I picked. <laughs> it's a great, yeah. It's such a great one. Well, it's getting a bit hot in here, but uh, it's about to get a lot hotter. <laughs> well, let's have a listen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Colleen. You, James. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you all. Hope you enjoy it as much as we do.